So thank you all for coming. My name is Sarah K. Grace, and I have been a licensed paramedic in California for 20 years now. I did 15 years in the 911 system, and I started with American Medical Response, which is a private transport company um, in the south central area of Los Angeles, where I did two years covering Compton, Inglewood, Carson, Hawthorne, and then eventually went up to uh, San Jose and the greater Sacramento areas. In addition to my field time, <clears throat> I've been a paramedic instructor and a national registry proctor forever. And so I am here to talk to you guys about the current state of the 911 system. So really modeling and looking after the Western, or the Western healthcare structure and society as a whole, essentially, it's a mess in layman's terms. The current state of the 911 system is a mess. So before we get into really what it is that we're facing as paramedics and first responders, has anybody here ever had to call 911? More hands than I thought. Okay, nice to know. And you don't have to necessarily tell me the call or the experience or why you had to call, but was it a did you have a good or bad experience with the overall response? The call was good, the paramedics were horrible. Was it attitude or time? It was the attitude. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hear that a lot. Great from both sides, good. Good experience, so-so. Time, attitude. The paramedics were not listening to you. Yeah. Okay. One was my mother had dementia and could not speak or understand well. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let me ride along. They wouldn't let me in the emergency room with her until they got her prepared. Okay. They were just thinking I was controlling her, but we don't know what to do with her. Right. There's a breakdown in communication oftentimes. We see that for sure. For sure. So what we're seeing more and more are these types of mixed reviews. So when I got into it way back in the day, it was just after 9-11. And so the climate for first responders in general was a completely different climate. Society revered and respected um, first responders. There was an influx of a ton of people that wanted to come in and be in the profession. There was a lot of esteem, a lot of support um, going through. But 22 years later, it's pretty much the polar opposite now, unfortunately. And it's really interesting being in something for so long that you can see and kind of go through the arc, you know, and experience the arc um, firsthand. And it's really symptomatic of society. I think we can look at pretty much any different, whether it's a profession or specifically the healthcare system and healthcare model, we've all seen a pretty significant shift and it's really breaking up, starting to break apart now is what we're starting to see. So very amazing. Um, so let's talk about what are first responders? So there's a lot of different kinds of emergencies. A uh, structure fire is going to be different than a mass shooting. That's going to be different response than a riot. That's going to be different response than, you know, just a standard medical aid. And so there's four pillars of first responders. First is going to be law enforcement. And right now in the last number of years, those guys are getting hit the hardest from a lot of society. And so they're uh, highway patrol, police in the cities, prison care system, the prison systems. Those are gonna be the entirety of the law enforcement. Then we have the EMTs and the paramedics. And so we're gonna be the medical side. Anybody know the difference between an EMT and a medic? Did you know there's a difference? So an EMT, emergency medical technician is basic. Okay, and we all start there. And so they do blood pressures, put the monitor on, talk to the patients, gather the medications, and usually drive the ambulance. Okay, and then eventually after training, and it's quite a bit of training, a couple of years of school and hundreds if not thousands of hours of patient contact depending on the system, 
then you can become a paramedic. And paramedics have the, the, the same scope as a physician. We just can't write uh, prescriptions. And we do everything like by flashlight on the back of a, like the trunk of a car in an alley at midnight. You know, it's a little bit different of a scene. But same scope and a lot more of the immediacy and the urgency, obviously. So law enforcement, then the medical side is EMT and paramedic. And then obviously the firefighters. We all know the firefighters with their engines and their calendars, right? And so the firefighters are great at vehicle uh, response. If they're going to, people are trapped and pinned in their cars, they go to the motor vehicle accidents, obviously the structure fires, those kinds of things. And now in most of the urban settings, they're coming on all of the medical aids with us uh, as the paramedics. And so you're gonna see a lot of people showing up on calls. It's really interesting. People who are not familiar with the 911 system don't realize that you're, depending on the system, you might get six people coming in on scene, right? So <clears throat> law enforcement, EMTs, paramedics, um, firefighters, and then life flight. And those guys are just amazing because they're going to be the critical care transfers. You see them a lot more in the rural settings. And then we're going to land the helicopters on some pretty critical scenes when it's greater transport time, ground transport time than 45 minutes for like trauma activations and stuff like that. And so it's just it, it, a lot of people don't know that there's different branches or different types of first responders. So I like to give you guys kind of a general introduction into that because you don't really think about it if you don't have to, right? You just kind of assume. And so how it goes down is say you call 911. Well, the, the call comes into dispatch and then dispatch is gonna go ahead and um, relay the call to the closest appropriate agency. Now remember, it has to be call specific. So is it a prison riot or is it a stress? So then the different apparatus are gonna get called out. Well, the other cool thing to know and what we're seeing in our, in our society right now, longer and longer and longer wait times for 911 providers. And there's a reason for that. And I'm going to break it down for you so you have an understanding why. And then we're going to get into the four primary things that first responders are really facing and some things we can do about it. Okay. So <clears throat> when the call comes in, it goes to dispatch, dispatch shoots it to the uh, appropriate apparatus and agency. Those guys get dispatched too. In an urban setting, if you ever drive, you know, you're going to the grocery store, you're going to Starbucks, whatever, you notice that there's fire stations kind of dotted throughout your city and then maybe throughout your county. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is because in an ideal world, there wants to be a six to seven minute response time in a city for any 911 call. That's the goal, okay? But what happens is, say there's a call in fire station one and the apparatus goes to that. Well, then that apparatus is obviously out. And so all of the different engines and ambulances, well, the ambulances really have to come out and start to move around the county like a checkerboard to try to keep appropriate coverage. And so as the call volume continues to grow and grow and grow, like we're seeing now, the apparatus are continually out and we're having lower and lower ambulance and engine availability. And that's why we're starting to see longer and longer 911 times. It's not like we're intentionally just like, oh yeah, we're just gonna take our time on your cardiac arrest. You know, that's not how it is. We're literally so bogged down right now. And so we're gonna get into that. What are the four things, the primary things that we as first responders, and I love academia. I think academia is amazing. Reading about things are cool and the research is cool, but it can be diff a little bit different or disconnected from like <laughs> the real world, right? So my intention here today is to just give you guys a real world boots on ground experience of what's actually happening out there. And it's pretty intense. So first responders by nature, we're, we're different. We're a different breed. Like everybody's running away. We're running towards it. So there's something in us that's wired that way. A lot of us are very type A, a lot of us are very masculine, like oriented, very aggressive kind of alpha by nature. And that's great. We need people like that who can kind of thrive in those pressures, right? But even, hi, welcome, come on in. Even um, those of us that have been in that and are wired for this type of thing are really feeling the the pressure cooker of what's been building over the last 10 to 15 years and we're at we're at a boil and it's just about to 
to pop realistically. So the number one thing that we're facing is unsustainable call volume. 240 million calls a year, uh, just in the US alone, that's 6,000 calls a day and growing, okay? And I thought this was amazing because in 2023 now, 75% of the 911 system is still volunteer in the US. Did you know that? 75% is still volunteer. And the volunteers, bless their hearts, again, they're choosing to do this. This is a calling. We're doing this because we want to help genuinely. And um, they have less training, they have less funding, they have less apparatus, and then they're definitely gonna have longer response times. But 240 million calls a year, 6,000 calls a day, much of which are being handled by volunteers, okay? And the majority of the 911 calls placed daily are actually non-emergent. So we get calls because people's toilets are clogged. We get calls because their smoke detector battery ran out. There was a woman in Ohio in 2015 who actually I believe was the only person ever charged with a misdemeanor because she called 911 to complain about bad Chinese food. That was her 911 call, okay? And we all understand, you know, an emergency is in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, but what people are not really grasping is that by saturating our system and our dispatchers and our units with non-emergent calls, it takes us away from the actual heart attacks, from the actual strokes, from the actual CPRs, and the, the people that really do need us in a, in a critical timing, okay? It's just, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So some everyday calls in the 911 system are going to be cardiac calls. So you have chest pain and then different AFibs, heart attacks. So you got shortness of breath, COPD, CHF uh, exacerbations, seizures, uh, weak and dizzy, falls, falls with hip fractures. Again, these are just the everyday calls that actually need us to be able to respond. Hi, welcome, come on in. Um, on the trauma side, you know, we, every day we got the, the car accidents. Uh, in, in the cities, we've got the gang violence and the shootings, and we have a huge escalation now in domestic violence and homicides, like pretty stratospheric rise in those over the past couple of years. So it's just kind of interesting, right? Did you guys know that people were calling 911 for clogged toilets? She did, or was it you? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so and she's... Yeah. Lift assist is going to be a transfer from a chair to a bed or from a yeah, bed to a wheelchair. We go on a lot of those as well. Yeah, and all of those, it's, it's amazing because I, I think people just, you don't think about it unless you need it, right? I mean, who does? Who thinks about who's going to show up for you in a crisis? You know, you just don't really think about it. But having a, a better understanding of kind of the overall topography or structure of the entire system gives you a better understanding of what it is that we're working with and that what, what people are actually calling us for. And really what we've seen, and, and this conference is an amazing conference and an amazing venue because it's really drawing to light the breakdown. Um, and it's not just you know the past 10 years, 20 years, this thing's been going on for a long time just down the breakdown in personal power, right? People just lack critical thinking skills. They have not been taught emotional intelligence. They have not been taught nonviolent communication. So if there's a, you know, uh, a, a little bit of a squabble between, between a neighbor that could potentially just be solved by, you know, effective communication, what we're seeing instead is gun violence. And that's just the reality of where we are. So fortunately, conferences like this, you know, we are kind of at the tip of the spear. We are those people who are holding that integrity and that vibration of awareness and self-actualization. 
and it's wonderful. Okay. So yeah, this is, we're, we're far down the road and the system is heavily impacted. And by us continuing to have the conversation, shine the light and then go talk to your neighbor and educate other people about it. Right. This is how we can one by one collectively shift that vibration. Okay. So the unsustainable call volume is going to be a primary thing. It's just not, it's just not conducive to health or life. When I got it, I was working South Central, granted that's going to be a super busy area, but I would come in at 6 a.m. and for a 24 hour shift, we would punch on, turn on the computer and there'd be calls lined up pending. And we would go from there for the next 24 hours, we'd be 24 to 25 to 30 calls nonstop. Okay. And a lot of fire departments now that are in paid city fire departments, they're running two days on, four days off is what they work. So, that's what I'm saying. That's the common structure right now. No, you sleep when you can and you eat when you can. Yeah. And so it's easy if you run in, you're in a station that runs five calls a day, but that's less and less unless you're in a very uh, rural setting. So when I was young and I just started out and I was green, I wanted that type of call volume for the experience. But as you mature, just like anything, it'll just grind you to a pulp. It's just not sustainable. And you have to understand that we're dealing with the darkest elements of the human condition in mind. We're dealing with the worst of the worst aspects of people every single day, day in, day out, day in, day out, year after year after year. And it just wears on you. If you're not doing a lot, to take responsibility for your own health. Uh, for me, it was understanding. I'm very sensitive to energy, so I've always been open to alternative and holistic. And I would just, I just, it's very important to have a lot of self-care to be able to balance out that much darkness. But when you're doing 48, two days on, four days off, two days on, four days off, like a lot of these firefighters are, they're just not able to recover. And what we're seeing right now is it's okay it, because the call volume is through the roof and the, uh, there's just not enough units in the system to cover the counties. People are being mandated. So imagine this, okay? You came to work two days ago. You've run 40 whatever calls. You haven't barely slept. You haven't eaten. And if you do, it's like just shoveling food in your face when you can. And then you're about to go home and it's your son's birthday and they say, sorry, you're forced. You have to stay here for another minimum 24 hours. And that's happening all over. So again, it's, it's a danger not only to us as providers, it's not sustainable to health, right? But we just, we're not machines. Nobody can function under those conditions and maintain. So if you get a bit cheap, person that shows up to your call, right? That's what people remember. It's like, that guy was a dick, right? This was my worst moment. He was a dick. And there's both sides of it. Maybe he's been on for 72 hours and really wanted to go home and, and missed his son's birthday party and there was nothing he could do about it. That's what it is that we're facing on top of it. Yes, sir. We're going to do the questions at the end, if you don't mind. Hold that thought. Okay, so the call volume, unsus unsustainable. The pay rate, did you guys know? I'm gonna blow your mind. EMTs make less than McDonald's and In-N-Out workers. So the person that's running the CPR on your spouse is being paid less than somebody who is flipping burgers. Isn't that amazing? The average salary in the US for a paramedic is $45,000. The average salary for an EMT is $35,000. Now granted, this was 20 whatever years ago when I started, I'm not gonna date myself, but you know. <laughs> I was making $7.70 an hour to run 911 calls in Compton and Englewood. We were being shot at. And I was making $7.70 an hour. I think they're up to like 14. Well, no, they just bumped it to 15, right? Still not sustainable. But most people, just the general public, don't know. Again, they assume that we're getting paid well. They assume that we're getting rest. They assume that we get breaks. Breaks? 
Now, granted, there are those, you know, fire departments, those guys with their recliners, they run like no calls, right? And so they get paid to sleep. But those are more rural areas. It's not the, not the urban, not the mainstream. So the pay rate, so just think about this. The, the work is crazy. We're dealing with the worst of the worst of humanity. It's a pressure cooker. The hospital systems are completely impacted. The nurses are not necessarily the nicest people just because of the volume and the stress that they're under. And the whole thing's just a powder keg, right? So here we come with more and more and more people that we're transporting. And we're a lot of people that I work with were full-time paramedics and they had to have second jobs to provide for their family. Most people don't know that, right? So burnout, obviously it doesn't take very long to burn somebody out in these conditions, right? Again, when we're young and we're green and we're in our 20s and we're just starting out, we all want that, you know? Um, but then it just collectively takes, takes it out of you. So the number one, I've written a couple of books. We'll talk more about this, but I wrote this book, Holistic PTSD Recovery for First Responders, Military, and Their Families. And here's the deal. First responders, like I said, we're pretty alpha. And it's like we're our own kind of unit. And a lot of them won't trust you or take any advice from you whatsoever unless you are one of them. And so I wrote this for them because I am one of them. And I wrote it in a language that they can hear, right? And what it is is just starting to break down the fact that, okay, the system is untenable. This will literally kill you if you're not uh, taking care of yourself. And so I start to introduce some of the holistic stuff that most of us know about, EMDR, infrared, like yoga, meditation, the basic kind of things, different stuff in there. But I interviewed a whole bunch of probably over 100 different first responders and combat vets and asked them, like, what is your number one coping mechanism? Guess. What is it? Alcohol. Alcohol. Good. Alcohol's number one. What's number two? Close, close, close. Overtime. Working overtime. Because it's like this cadence. You go on duty. You're with people who understand you, right? When you go and you're like dealing with brain matter across the freeway or the dead baby or the whatever, these are like such intense um, experiences that it bonds you together, right? So a lot of times what we see is first responders feeling more at home when they're at their station or at work, and they less and less are able to function in like normal home settings. They don't necessarily feel, because it's such a paradox, it's such a polarity. I remember when my kids were really little, I took them to the park, and we had just had a really bad batch of heroin go through and we had like 14 ODs. And so I was thinking about that as I'm pushing my kid in a swing. And these other moms are talking about nannies and pedicures. And it's just like this, you know, how do you, how do you, <laughs> so you're going to naturally kind of gravitate over here towards the people who were there with you. It has started to shift it a bit. It has started to open. There are more people that are starting to talk about their feelings and starting to own the fact that, yeah, I'm actually having some problems because the drinking is number one. The working overtime is number two. From there, pick your poison. It's going to be gambling. It's going to be affairs. It's going to be any kind of anything. But usually they can, they can compensate for a while until it starts to decompensate and it starts to spin and we're seeing more and more and more suicides. We have 25 to 35 suicides a day in first responders and military. And we're seeing some guy just one in LA or it was somewhere in Cali, just came back. Uh, he had got into it with his captain or whatever, went home, came back, got his gun, shot his captain, shot himself. We had another guy just recent, and I, I ran calls with this one. Got off duty, totally fine, didn't say a word to anybody. Goes to, uh, to an overpass on the freeway, gets out of his truck, jumps. It's just, 
you hit critical mass until you just can't anymore, right? And so this is just the reality of kind of what we're facing. And it can be overwhelming. It can be a lot for sure. Um, what do we do? What do we do about it? I don't want to be all doom and gloom, even though the 911 system is pretty intense. What do we do? Well, fortunately, as we know, and as we're starting to see, things have gotten so saturated and so compressed and so intense that it's really forcing the hand, right? If you're at 25 to 35 suicides a day, you got people going out because they got, they got to go into rehab or whatever. You got people breaking down, their backs are going out, their shoulders are going out, they're needing surgeries because we're having to lift all these heavy people all the time. The whole system is breaking down, so we're not able to staff because nobody wants to work for less than McDonald's money to get shot at and cussed at and puked on and you know swung at and all of the things. This is the reality of where we are. But it's, it's gotten so potent and so saturated that fortunately things are starting to crack open and we're starting to have these tools come in. There are more um, programs for first responders and for military personnel to begin the process of finding some help and having that assistance, if you will. It's slow because again, they're alpha and they're dense, but it is very slowly starting to shift and to break open. So those are really the primary talking points. If I'm gonna take questions, do we need a microphone or how do we do it? I'm gonna make you work. Is this helpful, you guys? Is it insightful? What did you know? What did you not know? Right? It will, but I mean, it'll, in California, it's still not a sustainable wage, right? right? The Bay Area firefighters are really the only, those guys make white collar wage because of the tax base. They're the only group of firefighters really that are getting paid very well. If you go over to New York Fire, everybody knows New York City's fire is like as legit as it comes. I think they run a million calls a year alone, probably more now. I think now they might be at 55 or 60,000 a year now. And that's New York City fire. It's crazy. Those guys are legit. We have a question. So how long have you been seeing this rise in suicides for one and the, the other violence that you're seeing? Has this been in let's say the last year and a half perhaps or since COVID, since the jabs came out, is there any correlation that you're seeing that people's behavior has changed since the jabs were released. The, everything is up. Suicide, death, violence, everything has escalated significantly in the last three years. Suicides within our field have been on the rise for about the last 10, but it's only come, people have only really started talking about it in the last five or so. So what we're seeing, that's a great question because it's like, yeah, pandemic, COVID, what's actually going on? Um, it, it What we're seeing is, just catastrophic rise in suicide across the board of, of response suicide. So there's a lot of people that call 911 because they say they're going to commit suicide or they want to. And then there's what we call suicide complete, right? It's done. They actually did it. Well, now we're seeing more and more of those where usually it would be more of, oh, I think I want to. Now we're seeing a lot more. And there is a 400% increase. Guess which demographic is the number one increase for suicide completes? Teenage girls. 11 to 14 year old girls, up 400%. I ran two of them, a nine year old and an 11 year old. It's crazy, right? Social media. Social media and being confined with family that doesn't, yeah. So we're seeing all of that. And then, but even, wor not worse, because it's all what it is, um, killing even more is fentanyl killing even more than COVID and, the, and suicide is fentanyl. And it is this silent thing. It's like COVID came over the top to take out a bunch of people. Fentanyl's coming from underneath. And it's mowing people down. Yeah, pretty much. She's saying fentanyl has replaced heroin. So what we're seeing is it's laced in everything now. 
which to me, it's kind of like, yeah, it may be coming cartel up from Mexico, whatever, however it does. But to me, I'm like, is that good business practice to like kill your clientele? Like what is actually happening here, right? But we have a lot of one and dones, what we call one and dones. These little teenagers who are just gonna experiment with some ecstasy or they're gonna experiment smoking some weed. It's laced, they're done. And we are seeing that all over and nobody's talking about it on the news. Hardly, it's starting to come out now, but it's because it's taken out way more people than COVID did. Since I have the mic, I just want to follow up question. Yeah. Is there an association or something for first responders where you guys are speaking out? Obviously you're here, but I'm here. is there is there a bigger like network of people who are, who are saying, look, this is a huge problem that we have, you know? It, it goes within the agencies. So we got a question back there. Um, it goes within the agencies. And uh, so for the there was a forced vaccination in a lot of the departments in California. And that was another thing that it was just like, talk about shooting yourself in the foot, you guys, because the people that retired out were like, I'm not doing that. They ran all of 2019, 2020 without it, just fine. And all of a sudden in 2021, 22, they got to get what? And so they just were like, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, it comes in as a mandate. Type A alphas, you don't make, like dictate, you know, especially those that have been working on the front lines just fine. And so a lot of them just said pound sand and they walked and they retired out. But what they did is they took the ones, the good ones, the ones that have been on for years and years, right? They took the, the educators and the people that are dialed and it leaves all of these like new green people that really don't know how to run calls. And so we've dealt with that with um, the, the VAX mandations. And some people have gone to the cities, like LA City challenged, they lost in court. LA County challenged, they lost in court. So we do have some starting to rise up with mixed reviews. And it's a whole thing. We know who owns the media and the media is orchestrating what it is, right? And they're very aware of what's happening. They just don't want to shine a spotlight on it. So having conversations and please, for the love of God, if you're going to take a pill, know where it's coming from because the everything's laced right now, pretty much. Okay. Two um, follow-ups on the recent topics you just covered. Luke wants to know why. <laughs> Hi, Luke. <laughs> why the um why they only make minimum wage and you said paramedics make more than there's two levels right yeah the emt is the basic level and the paramedic is the advanced level okay they're, they're not much different not much different so why the heck would it be so low it's just what it is they're in the medical field isn't that usually higher than mcdonald's you would you would think so <laughs> Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, tax base. And then if you're with a private tra uh, ambulance company like I was, it just is what it is. Like when I got in, they could pay me $7.70 an hour because there was so many people coming into the field at the time to do it. Now they're starting to offer hiring bonuses because nobody's coming anymore. So we'll see how it balances out. Okay. Another thing is, could you list out what are all the things you know that would be laced with fentanyl, Inclu everything. including non-drugs? Can you list out? Pretty much everything. So definitely marijuana and then all of the street drugs. Um, I don't know like food necessarily. I haven't heard of any of that kind of stuff. But I do know of officers. we got 10 minutes. Thanks for the heads up. Um, fentanyl is it's extremely, it's, if you take a penny and you just put like, not even a tenth of the penny, and you put fentanyl on it, that's a lethal dose. So you, you got, die, you die. Like then. you're done. So oh, what wow. happens is it's uh, 10 to 50 times as powerful as heroin or morphine, and it just knocks out your receptors to be able to, to breathe. And we have Narcan for that, right? So usually we just come in, wake you back up. Like if you're a nice medic, you're gentle and wake them up slow. If you're in a bad mood, you slam it and they wake up and vomit. And they so lose what's the time order. span between taking it and being able to use the Narcan. Well, we would have to administer the Narcan, but we're running out of Narcan is the problem because it would take me two to three uh, um, doses for fentanyl to bring you back the same it would off of heroin. But what's the time span like if they die? If they die and you can't be brought back from Narcan with Narcan? Yeah. When they stop breathing. When they stop breathing. So, I mean, two Oh, so minutes. it's not that long. 
no, no, this is fast. They just go, night, night. Crapshoot whether you're going to be brought back or not. Yeah. I mean, if, you, oh. if you're on an overdose with Narcan on scene, that's going to be one of the most um, resuscitatable, I don't know if that's a word, but it's going to, we're going to be able to bring you back as opposed to like a cardiac arrest that was found down and we didn't know why. But what I was going to say is officers were fine. They have it in little baggies and transports. And so people are handling it and not meaning to, and they're getting contact exposure and dying. So when you ask what's it in, it's in just be aware of all the drugs, even we, even marijuana, right? Really the benign ones, the little baggies, it's everywhere. Yeah. So just be aware. Question here. You want the mic? Yeah, because we can't hear you back there. How do you and how does this community handle personal grief when you're already around dying every day? Does it change that process of personal grief somehow? Yeah, most people just harden and numb to it and don't process it until they themselves have a heart attack or a stroke or drink themselves that's just where we're at but it is starting to change like i was in that space i've um, seen watched and seen many many people die and had all kinds of experiences but for me i always had this awareness that i really needed to take care of myself and so now i understand that by providing insight on how i did it like hey i was there too guys i know exactly what that feels like and what it looks like and what it smells like right here here's some tools um where we're at now though unfortunately is still most of them are just hardened and walled off and so it's starting to soften but slowly two questions um do you have the book here for sale i have books here for sale okay. and workbooks <laughs> And um, for the non-emergency calls, do you know of anybody working on anything? I, our fire department talks about, you know, how do we send out a person instead of a whole, you know, two people, the whole full ambulance. I mean, there have been heart attack calls where we've had to ask for mutual aid mm -hmm. for someone to come from farther away. And then the person, you know, complains, obviously. Mm -hmm. I pay for this service and you're not available. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. So, and then we are fully staffed in our, our town, um, but the towns around us aren't, or they're volunteer, so they just lean on us a lot. Yeah, that's and a great question. In some areas, they're trying to, because we have what we call frequent flyers. They're the people who call 911 every day or multiple times a day. I think the record for me was one guy called like five times. I think I transported him three times in one shift, and I was like, dude, but he wanted a sandwich and a warm bed. You know, we get these people who call at three in the morning because their Norco or their Oxycontin ran out. And they want to ride to the hospital or a taxi service. So they're taking us out, right? So for 5150s, mentally uh, ill people with no medical complaint, trying to get those uh, instead of having to go by ambulance to be able to go by officer. Um, but it's such a fine line and it's so red tapey because any little thing happens and everybody's so happy, right? And so it's just a ball of, right? But it is what it is, and by continuing to communicate about it, like there's things you guys didn't know. Now you know. Now you can go tell people, oh, my gosh, you know all these people are not making any money? Let's change that, right? So what you can do is thank a first responder, okay? Thank a, if you see us, like, sitting in the <laughs> – this cracks me up because we'd be um, – at, outside the grocery store sitting in the ambulance like with our coffee whatever and people are like what are you lazy what are you doing and I'm like no I'm covering the entire county for you like I am the sole ambulance right so thank you so if you see somebody sitting in an ambulance posting like that's what we're doing and so thank a first responder uh, have conversations you know it's just all of us coming together, bridging and being supportive. Hopefully this will continue through awareness. It'll continue to shift uh, for something more positive. So one more question, then we go, we got two more. Time for two, quick, quick. Yeah, two questions. Uh -oh. One piggyback on what you're just talking about as far as the 911 call, the burden, who knew um, us, spreading the word certainly, but are there educational programs in communities? I mean, I didn't realize that people are calling for, you know, all kinds of reasons that aren't emergencies or related to what, how you can help us. Mm -hmm. How are they educating the public 
on that to get the word out so people like us, everybody knows like, this is 911, this is not, absolutely do not call for this, maybe do this, or do your non-emergency call number, something to right. educate the public because I think most of us here are probably ignorant about this. Yeah, and that's why I'm here. And so it starts here and it goes out slowly. I think different agencies have different plans in place, but it is really slow because again, everything is an emergency to most lay person right now. And we have, um, uh, yeah, it's just where we at, we, where we are with the, the people right now. Okay. One final okay. question. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 21. In 2021, and it happens before, but it's more like a statement just for like people's knowledge. Like they have like what's called blackouts where hospitals won't accept ambulances and stuff like that because the hospitals are so overrun and, and then the ambulances have to like try and reroute, which you guys still show up anyway. But that's no what I'm saying. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is like also like we've had like ambulances sit in the bays. Oh, yeah. For hours. We call it being on the wall. Yeah. Where so we're they can, stuck at they the can hospital. sit in the ambulance bays for hours with patients in the back of an ambulance waiting because the hospitals are so packed. And the hospitals are packed because, like, there's a lot of non emergent people yeah. coming to the hospitals because they want Tylenol for their baby or they stub their toe. It's just, it's a system, a complete system breakdown. Yeah, and, that's a great way to say it. Yeah, it's a complete system breakdown because it's like instead of going to your doctor, because you have to make an appointment, oh, I'll just go to the ER. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, you're sitting in the ER and then it's just, it's a it's a huge train wreck and it's literally a powder keg waiting to blow up. So mm -hmm. take care of yourself, y'all. Watch out for your families. Yeah. Because like, well it's, it's literally, it's bad. And I was just going to say, every time I see an EMS, I always say thank you, paramedics, because you guys do not get paid enough. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate you. I tell paramedics that all the time. I've been doing ICU for the last two years, but I usually do ER. I always say thank you to you guys because you do work very hard. Thank you. So thank you for that. Appreciate that. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. I've got some books here. Love to connect more.